Back pain can kill. Red flags of the spine. Red flags. Red flags. We're all aware of red flags. Men that have plaid sheets, flattering DMs from an exotic female whose username ends in a bunch of numbers. Anyone who has an apostrophe in their name or maybe life coaches who look unable to grow a prepubescent moustache. Well, what about back pain red flags? Neck pain red flags. What are they? What does that even mean? What is their significance? Well, who am I? Well, I'm Stuart Cox, veteran physiotherapist and owner of Movement First Education and Consultancy. I'm all about facts, evidence and no BS when it comes to back and neck pain. So this video is going to go into the latest evidence and I will offer you a completely free guide that uses this evidence to work out whether you have significant signs of serious pathology of the spine. Okay, neck and back pain is everywhere and people are in serious pain. They want pills, they want quick fixes, they want to zap themselves with cattle prods, they want strange people to manhandle them in baby oil. But first of all, they want to know that it's not a sign of something far more sinister. This video could save yours or someone else's life, that's true. It isn't here to alarm you, but rather present the facts that show that while in some cases spinal pain can be very serious, the bulk of back and neck pain is most likely not from serious pathology. You might be someone who has back or neck pain right now, or perhaps you're in the health game and you want to know the actual data on these red flags. Let's get into a wee story first. Spinal pain can be serious. Now let me tell you of a young chap who had some moderate back pain, but also had severe constipation, erectile dysfunction, and was losing his bowels in his pants three times per week. Now, doesn't really sound too flash, does it? Well, as a fit, educated 25 year old, he just thought this was a passing symptom phase and that he could work through it. So he didn't take time off work, he refused to go to hospital, and get immediate medical attention. We all know these types who seem to be in self-destruct mode by working themselves into an early grave or being unable to give themselves time to gather their thoughts and rationality. So what did he have? He had corda equina syndrome, whereby the lower spinal cord impeded, causing possibly permanent damage to the nerves going down to your private regions slash fun parts. Moreover, he suffered psychological trauma also as he feared having a sexual relationship he was worried about being able to ever conceive children and had the embarrassment of crapping his pants in public so what would have happened well he most likely would have had some serious medical intervention and possible surgery within 48 hours if he'd taken the correct advice that he'd been given long before he arrived in my consultation so you can see my point is that back and neck pain can be the sign of serious medical issues. Fractures, cancer, kidney infections, burst appendix, we'll get into some of these in a second. So when dealing with spinal pain, we must consider these things every single time. Yet many clinicians, like myself, did not or do not understand the risks fully and fail to appropriately ask questions to decide whether there is a major risk of serious pathology of the spine. Traditionally, Doctors like to think they're the only ones that have the skills to accurately highlight the symptoms that require further investigation. But the fact is that the red flag questions used by doctors remain largely not backed up by evidence either. It is one of the big reasons why many doctors are found to ignore the guidelines set by specialists, the researchers, the academics, and top clinicians, and send people for lots of unnecessary scans of the spine. So this, in turn, leads us down the path of unnecessary radiation, unnecessary stress, unnecessary fear, inappropriate treatments, and even inappropriate surgeries that we don't really need. It's one of the reasons why I started Movement First, and it's why I'm on this mission. Let's get into the red flag risk data. This is presenting to medical facilities for back pain, okay? So the way I'll do it is I'll tell you what the pathology is, what some of the typical symptoms are in the research, then give you a percentage of people in a certain population that test positive for the condition. This is known as prevalence. Okay, so when you're noting these percentages, from the studies, they're coming from different clinical settings. So higher percentages usually come from back pain presentations in specialist clinics or perhaps emergency, whereas lower percentage findings invariably come from primary care settings, such as GPs, 
family doctors, physio clinics, chiropractic, etc. Think of it like this, the back specialist who only sees chronic back pain patients and complex cases is far more likely to see someone with cancer of the spine rather than your local GP who's dealing with all the runny noses and toenail fungus and yeah, fun stuff. As I said, the data is gonna be in the credits. You can look up these research papers if you want. Spinal malignancy is cancer of the spine. Think tumors, malformations, affecting bones, cartilage, soft tissues, nerves. These could be either primary tumors or secondary metastatic tumors. The symptoms and signs to look for are history of any type of cancer, significant unexplained weight loss, pain at night when you're resting, being at over 60 years of age, and the prevalence rates are estimated being 0.00 to 0.7% for back pain presentations in primary care, and 0.1% in ED or emergency, and 1.6 to 7% in spinal clinics. So overall, fairly low. Spinal fracture, okay, what is it? It's a break in a bone of the spine, whether it be from trauma like a car accident or from perhaps pathological fractures caused by some condition like osteoporosis, where the bone becomes more brittle and less dense and it's more prone to breaking. So the signs and symptoms, if you have back pain and you have any of these symptoms, keep these things in mind. Major or significant trauma. That is, you fell greater than one meter or five stairs, they say in some studies. Vehicle accidents, blunt traumas, History of previous osteoporosis fractures. Thoracic pain, this is because the bulk of non-traumatic fractures are in the thoracic spine. Use of steroids or immunosuppressive drugs for greater than three months. Being female, age 50 to 70, they have a 12% osteoporotic fracture prevalence. Being female greater than 70 years is over a 20% prevalence rate for osteoporotic fracture. Okay, so let's get into the prevalence rates overall. For osteoporotic fractures, 0.7 to 4.5% in back pain presentations in primary care. And this increases to 5.6% in the spinal clinics, the specialist clinics. Trauma fractures are found in less than 1% of back pain presentations in primary care like your GP physios. Okay, next condition, red flag. Corda equina syndrome, which is like old mate I spoke about earlier, whereby you get something causing a narrowing or damaging of the lower spinal cord, resulting in pain, loss of sensation, bladder and bowel issues, sexual function issues, weakness in the legs okay so those are some of the signs and symptoms we're looking for saddle anesthesia in the groin area any numbness loss of sensation bladder and or bowel dysfunction often together is more of an alarm bell leg weakness bilateral leg pain now prevalence rates for quarter equina syndrome are only 0.04 percent of total back pain presentations and 0.4 of a percent of back pain presentations in a specialist spine clinic so even in a specialist clinic the rates of quarter Aquina syndrome are pretty low. Next red flag, infection of the spine. Okay, can be bacterial, fungus, viral, affecting either the vertebrae, the spinal cord, or any of the tissues surrounding it. it. Can be from blood infections, trauma, or may have spread from other parts of the body, or could be a result of maybe a surgical procedure. The signs and symptoms you're looking out for are fever, and chills, pain at night or at rest, recent infection history. Once again, use of steroids or immunosuppressors greater than three months because people with immune system disorders are more at risk. IV drug usage, again, more risk of infection. Prevalence of infection of the spine is 0.01% in primary care and 1.2% in specialist spine clinics. Again, low, very low. Red flag! Scoliosis of the spine is a sideways curvature which can be caused by a range of things like genetic conditions, neuromuscular conditions like cerebral palsy, degenerative conditions like arthritis, or just from nothing specific, which is what they call idiopathic scoliosis. Got nothing to do with idiots. Prevalence rates of scoliosis are wildly variable from all kinds of studies. And it must be said that many people have completely pain-free, mild scoliosis. They don't even know they've got. Uh, it's not a serious pathology in those cases. It's a very debatable red flag unless it is severe. So rough estimates by the American Association of Neurological Surgeons were that about two to 3% of the entire US population has scoliosis of some type. While a recent review estimates 3.1% of children and adolescents has scoliosis. So this is why family doctors have such an important role in monitoring any spinal curvatures of children. 
as early management can help these kids immensely and prevent you know, degradation of the spine and further other effects of the scoliosis later in life. What about the oldies? Well, rates in the elderly do increase substantially, but studies vary. Some say 15%, some go up to 68% of people in those studies over the age of 60 years have some scoliosis. So that's the major back pain red flag. Red flag! Now you'll note that I didn't list neurological or nerve pathology as a red flag in low back pain. And this is because studies estimate that high percentages of people with back pain have a nerve-related component. But one study said about 47%, while another one quoted up to 90%. That said, if you have severe pins and needles or numbness or leg weakness, then you should get that addressed ASAP by a skilled clinician. It doesn't mean you should necessarily need a scan of the spine though. Let's take me for example, I experience sporadic tingling in two of my arm nerves, thanks rugby. But given that I rarely get any associated pain or limitation of activity, I've never had them scanned. Now, if this changed suddenly and I found myself unable to do that or something, you know, like that, then I would get a scan done. Okay, in summary, for back pain red flags, the serious pathology presentations are pretty darn low in people with back pain. This means that only very few of us with significant symptoms should be sent for x-rays, for CT scans, or MRI. If you're impatient and uh, don't care about my next spiel on neck pain red flags, well then just hit the link below and just go to movementfirst.org to get my free spinal risk red flag checker tool that's based on all these latest studies, combinations of symptoms and signs, and is what I use for all my patients and I try and encourage junior physios to do as well. Otherwise, tap the link for neck pain red flags. Let's get on to the neck. Hooyah!